Hello everyone, this is Charlie from the Bloomingdale Public Library and welcome to Tinkercad for Beginners. It's a fun and easy way to learn 3D design in your browser. So what exactly is Tinkercad? Tinkercad is a free cloud-based program for 3D design, circuits, and coding. Because it's cloud-based, it means all you'll need is a computer and a connection to the internet to use. You won't need to download or install anything. You also won't need a very strong computer in terms of processing power in order to do anything. The program is used in a web browser, like I said. Chrome or Firefox or any of the other ones should be fine. And then simply go to their website, Tinkercad.com, and log in. Tinkercad files can be downloaded for printing, 3D printing, or even editing in another 3D editor if you have one. Tinkercad has a basic interface and limited functionality, but it's a great place to start learning about 3D design. If you tried our Blender course a couple of months ago, um, you'll notice it had a whole lot of options and menus, and it would probably take several college-level courses to learn everything there is to know about it. But in Tinkercad, we'll probably cover most of what there is to know in the next 30 minutes or so. So Tinkercad is a service provided by a company called Autodesk, who is a major company in the 3D design industry. If you go ahead and visit their website at autodesk.com, you'll see their more robust, slightly less affordable products like AutoCAD, Inventor, and 3ds max and while those programs are industry standards they run about two thousand dollars a year for a subscription so to get started with tinkercad all you got to do is open a web browser go to their website and click join now and from there there's a couple options as far as how you sign in putting in your birthday because you need to be a certain age to log into a website but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and have a look at that. I'm going to click on Google Chrome. Type in Tinkercad.com. And that should take you to a set website that looks something like this. In the upper right-hand corner is where you see the Join Now button. Click on that. Again, create a personal account. Choose how you sign in. I'm not going to go through the whole process, but when you're done, it should take you to either the dashboard or the profile page, which I'm logged into in Firefox, actually. And this is the dashboard. And if it takes you to another page, simply click on the logo in the upper left corner, and it should take you to this page here. So let's have a quick look at what is on our dashboard. On the left side, we see 3D designs, circuits, and code blocks. That'll determine what kind of, of file we're going to create. There's lessons, which is a great place to learn more on how to do the basics and look at some more complicated projects. If we go down a little more, there's your classes. That's for actual classes with a, a teacher and a sign-in code and things like that. Projects are basically folders that you would put your individual designs into. You can click on uh, Tweets by Tinkercad to follow them on Twitter. If you click on this little break, Blank uh, profile picture here. It'll take you to your profile. I don't have anything filled in, and you don't need to fill it in at all if you don't want to. Um, why you might want to do this is because there is a community. You can actually make your designs public and choose to like and comment on other people's public designs. So going back, again, you click on the logo in the upper left. You see we have the gallery. This will take us to some of those public designs. So you can see what other people have done. Uh, comment, like, and even download a whole lot of them. You've got the blog where you can see what people at Tinkercad are working on. Click on Learn, which again is where we have starters, lessons, and projects, which are basically easy, medium, and hard levels of activities you can try. Don't forget to click on the bottom to see all starters, all lessons, or all projects to see what else there is. So all of these will have step-by-step -step ways to complete these projects. And then if you wanted to go searching for other people's projects for a particular kind of design, you click on the magnifying glass and type it in the search box here. And that is getting logged in and having a look at the dashboard. 
So here we are back at the dashboard. Again, if you ever needed to get back here, you just click on the logo in the upper left-hand corner, and it'll take us here. So in the middle here, you probably don't have anything, whereas I have a whole bunch of squares with rotating 3D designs. That's because this is where the files are that you've already created. So if you have a file that you've already created and you want to open it back up, you just roll over it, click Tinker This, and it'll open the file for you. We're getting started from scratch, though, so let's create a new design with the button here and that'll take us to our workspace so we're gonna have just a quick look at what we're looking at and then we'll dive into the specifics of each little tool so at the upper left again we've got our logo to take us back to the dashboard we've got this little menu looking guy here which will open up all of our previous designs if you wanted to open up something that you worked on previously. And then next to that, it says Mighty Fear Ran, whatever. This is going to be a randomly created file name. If you wanted to make it something of your own creation, something more original, just click on it, enter it, click away. Over all the way to the right here, we have a couple other options. Um, the first option is 3D Design. And I'm just going to put some things on the workspace to show some of the other ones. Next to that, it looks like a Minecraft pickaxe. If you click on that, it puts everything into this kind of Minecrafty block sort of look. Next to that, it says bricks, but it looks like a Lego. And that's what happens if you click on that. You can't really do much editing from these views, but it's nice to toggle back and forth and see what things look like if you were making a 3D design for Minecraft or for Legos. So I'm going to click back on the 3D design logo right here. Next to that, if you wanted to have more people come and work on it with you, which I've never done, you click on this guy here and you can invite them. So going down further here, you'll see we've got copy, paste, duplicate, delete, undo, and redo. Most of those do what you'd expect, though probably not the duplicate. If I deselect the object, you see those are no longer highlighted. Over on the other side, we have some grouping options. So if I select multiple options here, here we go. We can group, we can align, we can do some mirroring. You'll also notice when I select some objects, we have this other window pop-up. This is the Windows property, uh, the, uh, not Windows property, it's the Shape Properties window. Um, what you can do here depends on what you have selected. Over on the left side here are some orientation gizmos and buttons. We'll get into those a bit. You don't actually need them in order to move around the space, but some people might find it helpful. Looking over on the right here, once again we've got shapes. You can scroll down and see all the shapes available. Above that are a list of menus for different, more complicated shapes. I'm going to go back to basic shapes. Above that are the work plane, ruler, and notes. I'm going to get into the work plane, but I'll probably leave the ruler and notes for another day. And above that is import, export, and send to. So that's things you can do with the file or even just an individual shape in the file. If you wanted to work on a, a shape from another file, you can import it. If you wanted to send the shape, for 3D printing or to be used in another program, that's when you'd export it. And send to has a bunch of other options tied to it as well that I'm not going to get into. The middle here is the main workspace. You'll start off with a work plane, and you see it's all divided into grids and units and such. If you wanted to edit the units and the spacing, you click on the edit grid. I'm not going to get any further into that. And then you'll notice there's also a snap grid option in the bottom right-hand corner, which can make things easier for lining up and combining. So we'll get into that one also a little bit later. So that's a general overview of the interface. With that, we'll start getting into the nitty-gritty. Okay, let's have some fun. Before we can really create anything, we first need to know how to navigate about the workspace. If you've ever worked with a 3D editor before or played 3D video games, it'll probably come pretty easy to you. If not, it'll probably take a little bit of practice. So the two ways we can navigate are with the mouse and with the tools on the left side. So let's have a look at the tools first. We've got the navigation cube at the top here and then a couple buttons beneath that. 
You'll notice as I roll over the cube, various spots turn blue. And that will be where our camera will move to. So if I click on top, the camera will give us a top view. And then we'll get these little arrows around the sides. If we click on any of those, it'll move us 90 degrees to that view. If we click on one of the sides here, you see the camera will move in between the two axes. And if we click on a corner, it'll split three axes. If you click and drag on the cube, you can basically orbit freely about the workspace. The button below that is the home view. That'll give us our default view. I pretty much put it back to where it started anyway. If you have a shape or two selected, you can click on the fit to view, and it'll zoom in on the selection. And center it as well, which is helpful. The plus and minus buttons are for zooming in and out. So if you wanted to zoom in or zoom out, those would be the buttons you'd use. And the button below that is to switch between orthographic and perspective. So perspective view will show things shrinking away from the camera, whereas orthographic, everything stays the same size independent of how far it is away from the camera. So you see things behind and in front don't shrink or grow depending on their proximity to the camera. Everything is um, about the grid, and the grid doesn't shrink. So if we go back to perspective, now we have our vanishing point and horizon. And things will shrink as it goes away from the camera. So that is how we use the tools. In order to use the mouse, you simply right click and hold and drag. And that's how we orbit about the workspace. So it's just like left clicking and dragging on the navigation cube. To zoom in and out, you can use the scroll wheel. And if you needed to pan, hold down shift, and then drag left, right, up, down, or whatever. And that will basically move the camera without rotating about the workspace or a selected object. I'm going to click on the home button here. And now we'll discuss how to add shapes to the workspace. So I've already added a couple so we could have a look at the different views. But to recap, you can either click and drag a shape from the right side onto the workspace, or you can click one time. And even without the button held down, you'll still see a little ghost of your shape. Simply click a second time to place the shape. So we can scroll down and add a different shape. Again, click once, click again to place it. And we can have a look at the menu to see what other options we have. See what looks, uh, looks like we have characters here. Let's go ahead and select characters. Scroll down, you can see what we have available to us. Again, click, and click a second time to place your shape. You'll notice when I have the mouse rolled over a shape. There's a little star in the right, upper right-hand corner. If you click on that, it will save the shape to favorites. So if I sh uh, favorite our AstroBot here, then click on the menu, you gotta scroll all the way to the bottom, and you'll see favorites. And you'll see the AstroBot is right there. So if you have some favorite shapes or if you create some of your own that you want to keep available to place out of the workspace, you, little, you click on the little star there and that'll put them in the favorite menu for you. So that is how we navigate about the workspace and then add shapes to the workspace. So now that we know how to place a shape on the work plane, we're going to want to learn how to transform it. The major transformations are translation, rotation, and resizing. So let's go ahead and discuss how to do that. I'm going to click on our shape, click on the work plane to place it. Now to move it, all we got to do is left click and drag. So left clicking and dragging will let us move it about the X and the Y axis. The X axis is left and right, the Y axis is up and down. To move it about the Z axis or to go up and down above and below the work plane, 
you need to click on the little black arrow above the shape and then drag and you can go up and down. You can also use the arrow keys if you click on a shape, hold down the left key or the right key, up key and down key. You can again move about the X and the Y axis. If you wanted to move about the Z axis, what you would do is hold the control key and then use the up arrow. And again, we can go up and down, above and below the work plane. If you hold down shift, you can move 10 units at a time. So again, holding down shift, and you can just tap left and right, up and down, to move about the X and the Y axis a little more quickly. Hold down control and shift, and now up and down will go up and down at 10 unit increments. So another way we can move things is if you click and drag, you might have noticed that we have values representing how much we're displacing the shape by. So like this 42 and 39 means we move the shape over 42 units and then down 39 units. And those values will be visible for three or four seconds and then they'll disappear. However, if you click and drag and then click on one of these values, you can enter a precise value and it will jump the shape to that displacement. To do the same thing with the z-axis, again, click and drag on that little arrow at the top of the shape, click on the value, enter your new value, hit enter, and there you go. So that's moving our shape or translating it. Next thing we want to look at is resizing it. To resize it, you might notice these little black squares on the edges at the bottom. Go ahead and click and drag on any of those. And you can expand the shape in that direction. If you wanted to change the dimensions of the shape in two directions at once, you click and drag on one of the white squares. So that will help us change the shape about the X and the Y axis at the same time. If you hold down the Alt key, the shape will go out and in both directions at the same time. So it will keep the center of the shape stationary. You can also hold down the Shift key to keep everything in proportion. To do this, about the z-axis, again, you use a little white square in the middle and drag up and down, hold shift up and down, or hold on alt up and down, and you can do the same things in the z-axis directions. Just like with moving, you can also alter the values that appear after you alter the shape of your shape. So again, clicking and dragging on any of the squares will show the values for a few seconds after you move it. Enter a new value, hit enter, and that is how you move and resize a shape. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about rotation decided to throw a cylinder in there just for a change of pace. And I'm going to zoom in a bit. When I select the shape, you'll notice that we have a rounded arrow at the top and the bottom. And there's even one on the sides, but it's kind of hard to see. I recommend you have a good look at this, the double-sided arrow before you try to rotate the shape because the functionality is kind of jumpy as it is. And if you're looking at an extreme angle like this, it's just going to make it that much more difficult. So anyway, once you have a good look at the double-sided arrow and you roll over it, you'll see you get a whole bunch of tick marks in a circle, 
and you also see the value of a rotation at the top there. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the double-sided arrow and start dragging left and right. And when I do, you'll notice it jumps 22.5 degrees at a time. If you wanted to go one degree at a time, what you do is you click on the double-sided arrow and you pull away from the center a bit. So you'll notice that there's tick marks that are a bit closer together the further away you go. Try to keep the mouse within the range of those tick marks and you should be able to move things a little more smoothly. If you wanted to jump at 45 degrees angle at a time, hold down the shift key. And again, we're moving at 45 degrees at a time. Let go once you have the angle you like, and then you can click away. Just like before, if you rotate your angle and you wanted to set it more precisely with the keyboard, just go ahead and click on the value, type in what you like, hit enter, and there you go. And that's how you go about rotating a shape. Again, the functionality is kind of jumpy, so be patient, and if you screw anything up, don't forget about the undo button at the top left. So what's kind of related to rotating our shape is mirroring, and that is on the top right here. So with the shape selected, if you click the mirror key, and the, uh, the mirror tool, we'll get three arrows in each direction. All you need to do is click on one of those arrows and it will flip the shape about that axis. So the center of the shape stays the same, it's just the shape itself is mirrored about one of the axes while keeping it centered in the same spot. <clears throat> Something else I want to look at right now is the duplicate function, which is up here next to the delete function, the little trash can here. What the duplicate tool does is not quite what you'd think. Over on the left, we have the copy and paste options, which you know work like copy and paste in Word or Excel or whatever. But duplicate will actually replicate any transformation that you apply to the shape. In other words, what I'm going to do right here is duplicate the shape. And this time it didn't do anything because everything is on top of itself. But I'm going to go ahead and apply a transformation here. So I'm rotating it, I'm moving it, and resizing it. And now when I hit duplicate again, it applies all those same transformations to the duplicate. So in other words, when I hit duplicate, it moved, it rotated, and resized the shape that was already moved, resized, and rotated. And if I hit the duplicate key again, it does it once again each time for each shape you duplicate. So something you might want to use that for is maybe a spiral staircase or creating a circle of shapes. But that is what the duplicate tool does. And if you didn't know what that's what it did, you might be pretty surprised at what you're looking at. So that was rotation, mirroring, and the duplicate. Next, I want to discuss the shape properties panel. Anytime you select or add a shape to the workspace, we get a panel to the right like we did just here. Let's have a look at some of our options in the Shape Properties panel. At the top, in the right corner here, if you click on the little open lock, it becomes closed. And you'll notice in the workspace, our shape no longer has any of the editing nodes, and if I click and drag on it, it does not move. So that shape is now locked for editing. And that's very helpful if you start to get a very complicated project going, and there's a lot of shapes on your workspace and you don't want to accidentally move things around, what you do is you lock them and they'll be locked in place and you can focus on editing the shapes that you want to edit without worrying about accidentally messing up your other shapes. To unlock it, you just click on the lock again 
and we've got all of our editing options available to us. Next to the lock is a little light bulb. If you click on that, the shape disappears. It doesn't actually be, get deleted or anything. It's still there, it just disappears. Again, if your workspace gets very complicated with lots of shapes and things are getting in the way and it's hard to edit things, what you can do is hide the shape and then when you're ready, click on the little light, light bulb at the top here and bring your shapes back. Below that, we've got the solid and the whole circles. If you click on the solid, we can change the color of our shape. You can even make it transparent, which looks like that. We're going to click on that, kill the transparency. Next to that is the hole. If you click on that, you'll notice our shape becomes transparent with a bunch of diagonal lines. We'll discuss holes a little bit later. In the meantime, back to solid, click away. Below that, we've got radius. If I start moving that around, you'll notice that the edges of the cube become rounded. And we have steps. If I zoom in a bit here, you'll notice, depending on how many steps there are, the curve of the corners will be a little better defined. So things will look better if you add more steps, but it'll also make the shape more complicated. And if you make too many complicated shapes in your design, it might slow things down a little bit. Below that, we have the length, width, and the height. You see right now they're all set to 20. But if I start messing around with the length and width in the workspace, it doesn't actually change in the properties panel. And I'm pretty sure that's a bug. You can still change these dimensions in the properties panel. But as you can see, this is set to 26.52 right now. and the actual length is 79.575. So this value is not correct. So you can use the sliders to change the values. Just be aware that these numbers aren't going to be correct, and I would generally advise not using these at all. Just to show another example, I'm going to bring the cylinder onto the workspace, and you'll notice this time our properties panel has a whole lot less options. We've got sides, which is how well defined our rounded edges are. We've got a bevel, which bevels the top. And then again, segments will be how well defined our bevel is. So play around with each shape's properties panel, just being aware that the length, width, and height won't always be correct and should generally be avoided. Next, we're going to talk about editing multiple shapes at once. To do that, Let's start off by adding a couple shapes to our workspace. To edit multiple shapes at once, all you got to do is select multiple shapes at once. So I'm going to click and drag a rectangle around all the shapes. And now, when I go to move any one shape, the rest of the shapes come with. We can also change the length, width, and height. And even rotate. Another way we can select multiple shapes at once is by using the Shift key. So if you select one shape and hold down the Shift key, you can select a second shape. Now you'll notice I only selected the two boxes, but it looks like everything is selected. That's not actually the case, though. So even though the selection box encompasses everything, the selection only includes what we shift clicked, it, clicked on, and that was the boxes. If we wanted to add the sphere to our selection, hold down shift, select the sphere, and again, we're moving everything at once. You just got to make sure to click and drag on an actual shape. If you click into an empty space, it just deselects everything. So again, I'm going to select everything. To deselect something that's already selected, just hold down Shift. 
select the object, and you see everything is moving but the sphere. Shift click on the cylinder. Once again, it's just the, just the boxes. So something else we can do while we're editing multiple shapes is align the shapes. So now with both of the boxes selected, you see we have some new options available. If we click on this little line with the two rectangles, that's the align tool, we'll get these little black circles around all the axes of each of the shapes and the encompassing space. So as you roll over each of the circles, you get a little preview of what's going to happen, which is very helpful. Just click on one of the circles, and the preview becomes reality. If you don't like what you did, you can always click the undo key up at the top there. You need to re-click the align tool. And that is how alignment works. <clears throat> Something that can make things a little easier in terms of alignment is to use the snap grid, which is all the way at the bottom right corner. So it's set to one millimeter by default. So anytime you move an object or place it, you'll notice we always have an integer value. If I were to click on SnapGrid and turn SnapGrid off, now you'll notice that I have fractions of a unit up to the one hundredth place. So up to a hundredth of a unit is now possible. What I find helpful is to actually turn the snap grid up. So I'm going to set it to five millimeters. And now, when I move my shape, it moves it in increments of five. And that can be very useful if you're stacking shapes and combining shapes, which we'll talk a little bit later. If everything is on a snap grid of five millimeters, it becomes a lot easier to line things up. You can still use the align tool, but by having everything snap at five unit increments, it makes it a little easier, and jumping back and forth with the align tool becomes a little less necessary. Keeping with the theme of editing multiple shapes at once, uh, we're going to talk about grouping. Grouping actually will turn multiple shapes into a single shape. So as before, where we were selecting multiple shapes and editing, editing them together as one shape, now we can actually turn multiple shapes into a single shape. To do that, go ahead and select multiple shapes. I'm going to go ahead and drag across all the shapes on the workspace here. And up at the top here, we have the group tool, where it's kind of a square and a circle as one shape. Once you click that, everything becomes a part of the same group. And it'll also match everything to one of those shapes' colors, usually the first one selected. You'll notice we have our shape properties panel here, but our only options available are solid hole, visibility, and locking. We don't have any sliders available to us. We can go ahead and change the color of our group to yellow. <clears throat> And you'll notice now, even if I click away and click on one of the shapes, everything is still selected. Everything moves together as it did before. Everything can be rotated and resized as it was resized before. But now, whenever you click away and click on something, it's still all considered a part of the same shape. It is all grouped. To break the group, all you got to do is click on the ungroup shape, and there we go. You can also group groups of shapes. So you can create like a group hierarchy. And to show you what I mean, I'm going to select both of the boxes and group them. Next, I'm going to select the cylinder and the sphere and group them. So now I can go ahead and move these groups together, each as their own individual shape. But 
if I go ahead and select both groups at once, you see once again, I can create another group. So now I have a group of groups. And with that, I can move everything around at once. I can change their colors. And if I go to ungroup them now, I still have the original two groups as their own discrete entities. So just something to be aware of, once you start creating very complicated shapes like a, a bicycle or an engine or something like that, grouping is something you're going to be doing a lot of. So you'll create a bunch of shapes, group them into the engine, group some more shapes, shape them into the, like the tires and the axles, <clears throat> and this constant layering of groups upon groups just makes it easier to keep everything either locked or invisible or organized if that's all you need it for. It's a very helpful tool. It's something you should definitely make use of. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of everything here and show you one more important part of grouping, and that's coming back to our holes. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to place a box on our workspace. I'm going to make it a bit bigger here. And now I'm going to click on the cylinder hole. And I'm going to place it right here, kind of intersecting. It's not really a big deal. In fact, it's such not a big deal that I'm going to add another one. And another one. And you know what? We're going to make this one big, too. So it really kind of looks like a confusing mess here. So what I'm going to do is select everything all at once here. And now I'm going to group them. And now what you see is four shapes grouped, but three of those shapes are holes. And all that happens is the hole cuts a hole in the solid shape. And just like before, you can ungroup them just like you did before. One last tool I'd like to discuss with you is the work plane. Anytime you place a shape in the workspace, it's going to lay flat on the work plane. By default, when you create a new file, you start with a work plane already in place. It's this blue square here. It says work plane on it. And just as you'd expect, when you go to place a shape, it will lay flat on the work plane. The work plane tool will let us create a second work plane off of the side of a shape already in the workspace. So just to demonstrate why this is so useful, I'm going to click on the roof shape here. I'll place it on the work plane. Just size it up a bit. And now let's say I wanted to place a cone on the angled side of the roof. So I can do that, but I'd have to place it onto the current work plane, to lift it up, I have to rotate it, and then get it to lay flush. So it can be done, but it's a small process. I'm going to delete the cone, and now I'm going to use the work plane tool. So when I click on work plane, you can see it will trace the sides of the shapes in the workspace with this little white square here. I'm going to go ahead and click on this side. And when I do, you'll see everything has changed quite a bit. The original work plane is still outlined in blue, so you can get your bearings and know which way is up. But we now have this new work plane, this orange square here. It says work plane on it again. And it's placed on the side that I clicked on. So now when I go to place a cone, it starts at the correct angle and at the correct positioning. So you don't need to use the work plane tool, but it's extremely useful. It's a huge shortcut. And once you start building complicated shapes with other shapes protruding out of it and other shapes lying on other shapes, it's extremely handy. So let's say we wanted to place a cube in another box. Once again, it goes right on the side there. And if we wanted to build off of one of the sides of this box, 
We can click on the work plane again. And it's just that simple. Oops. So you can cre create new work planes off of the sides of any shape, even if that shape is already on an angled work plane. When you're all done creating your shape with the, uh, the altered work plane, all you got to do is click on the work plane tool, and you can click on the original work plane, and you're working as you would normally. So let's say you're all set, you like your shape, you want to 3D print it or work with it in another program, you'd have to go ahead and download it. To do that, we would click export. And you can choose a 3D print straight from the program if you have a printer set up. But we don't, so we'll click download. You choose from either the currently selected shape or from everything in the design. You usually want everything in the design. And then you have to choose your file type. So OBJ will retain a second file that will remember the colors as well as the shapes, whereas the STL will just give you a single shape file. And usually for 3D printing, that's good enough. And then once you do, click Save File, and it will stick it in the download folder. So I named this file File 1 way back, not the most original of names. But now when I go into the Downloads folder, you'll see there I've got it. And there's a couple there because I was practicing earlier. So that's all I have for you. Uh, I know there's a couple other tools and plenty of tips and tricks for making more complicated shapes, but I think we've got a pretty good start. If you wanted to learn more, you can go back to the dashboard by clicking on the icon in the upper left, clicking Learn, and then go through all of the starters, lessons, and projects. There's a lot of very inf useful information there. You can also go to LinkedIn Learning through our website, or you can probably find a whole lot on YouTube as well. I hope you found this educational and fun, and I wish you good luck in your 3D designing.